This OIS interview was conducted before Bausch & Lomb completed its acquisition of Zydra, Lafitigrast Ophthalmic Solution 5%, and before Bausch & Lomb's Mibo, Perfluorohexaloctene Ophthalmic Solution became available at pharmacies nationwide. Welcome to the OIS podcast. I'm Dr. Paul Carpecki. I practice in Lexington, Kentucky. I have the honor of getting to uh, host these podcasts occasionally, and this is one I'm extremely excited about. Uh, timing couldn't be any better. There's so much going on at Bausch & Lomb, and it's wonderful to see that. 170-year-old company, we all recognize, our patients recognize the name incredibly well. Uh, but to see so much going on uh, and so much excitement within the company, this makes for a very timely uh, podcast. So I want to begin by welcoming, yeah, yeah, Dr. Shad and Andrew Stewart, two of our guests, uh, top executives at Bausch Shalom. Thank you for making the time to be on the OIS podcast. Thanks, Paul. Great to see you again. Thank you. Good to see both of you again, too. Save the date as OIS returns to San Diego on December 1st and 2nd. Our 13th flagship summit unites corporate, clinical, and capital leaders driving novel therapies for both the front and back of the eye and focuses on addressing unmet needs across all of ophthalmology and optometry. Registration and applications to present are now open. Head over to ois.net and click on events for more information. Your path to innovation begins here. Let me just start with something I often begin with. Just, uh, Andrew, we'll start with you and we'll go to, yeah, yeah, after that. But, you know, briefly walk us through a little bit of your personal background. I mean, a lot of us know you from Allergan days as well, and then it came Abby and everything, but kind of where you grew up, education, kind of your professional path into eye care. Was it right into eye care? Did that evolve over time? And then I'll do the same thing for Dr. Hasha. Sure, sure. I'm, I'm happy to. So, so Paul, I have a uh a bit of a non-traditional background into uh, a commercial leadership role. So I'm a chemical engineer by background. I spent uh, a large majority of my career in pharmaceutical manufacturing at Merck, at um, in R&D, at Bristol-Myers Squibb. And, and yet I always had this passion to try and, and learn more about our business and, and around our broader operations in terms of our interactions with patients and physicians and our commercial footprint. And so I went back and got an MBA from NYU uh, later in, in my career and then was able to, to move into business development. And that was my first foray into, into eye care. And, and I've been in eye care now for about eight years uh, and have had just different opportunities within different leadership positions at Allergan. And now recently, uh, about three months ago, had a chance to move over to Bausch and Lam and, and be reunite, reunited with my, my colleague, uh, Yahia here. And uh, and I'm thrilled to be here and, and looking forward to the, the conversation today. Thank you. You here? Yeah. So uh, great pleasure to be with you, Paul, and the OIS podcast. A uh, little bit about my career. I am actually an ophthalmologist by background. I'm originally from Egypt, finished my residency there, and went to a fellowship in Germany for retina. Uh, I was fortunate enough that at that time I was uh, looking forward to be working in one of the biggest unmet medical needs, which was AMD at that time. We didn't have much options. There was only uh, Visodyne uh, at that time available for the treatment of these patients. I was fortunate after working for about four years in Germany that I get from Novartis a proposal to work with them in the industry. And they announced that they have a new platform that they are working on. Again, I was fortunate to move there to start working on the anti-VGFs in Novartis at that time, together with Genentech as a collaboration. And uh, it, the whole career in industry started, spent seven years in Novartis, and then moved to Allergan in 2010, where I was responsible also for the R&D for uh, eye care, um, starting with the Ozodex platform to get it approved. And then after this, we moved also to other implants like Durista and glaucoma. Obviously, I had some work also on the restasis. So it was a great journey in Allergan, spent about 13 years, and then uh, left Allergan in 2021 and joined Bosch and Lomb last year in March 2022. Oh, great paths. It's interesting to see how both your paths came from different backgrounds. One is an ophthalmologist, a retina yeah. specialist. The other is a chemical engineer and and here you are at Bausch and Lohm and, and with uh, you know with Brent Saunders now at the leadership. So I want to delve a little bit into that new leadership, which includes obviously the U3 and and quite a team at Bausch and Lohm. 
I feel like there's almost a resurgence of the company, kind of this strong momentum. People are talking a lot about p and it's, uh, it's obviously very evident. But please uh, tell us uh, what's occurring at Bausch & Lomb and how the leadership is looking at the future for a company that's 170 years old. Yeah, look, I'll, I'll add a couple of comments first, and, and certainly here I can pass it over to you a- afterwards. So, Paul, you can see uh, and feel a buzz within the company right now. And so culture is bred from a lot of different things, but most importantly, it's bred from winning. And so when you look right now at what's going on with the company, not only some of the recent external uh, decisions that we've made around collaborations and partnerships and, and potential acquisitions that we have, but more importantly, some of the recent pipeline activities. And so when you think about MIBO, and we'll talk about that, I'm sure, later throughout the course of the conversation, we have a, a first-in-class dry eye asset for the treatment of evaporative uh, dry eye disease. We're extremely excited to bring that product to market. And so um, you know, I think that when you look at the, the company right now, it's well-positioned as an integrated eye health company dedicated to, uh, to multiple different facets of working closely with not only uh, physicians, but their practices and helping them with their day-to-day challenges. And more, and more importantly than that, partnering to help patients with, with different serious needs within eye care. Yeah, yeah anything you want to comment on? Yeah, no, I think I would, uh, you know, Andrew, I think summarize it very well. I would just add that it, it was a very exciting time. Uh, as you probably know, um, eye care is a, is a very particular speciality. Uh, once it is part of a bigger organizations, you don't have much of the focus on the eye care, especially with regard to investments, especially with regard. So it's a great to see now that there is an integrated, focused eye care company that all the investments going in different unmet medical needs in the eye care area. And I think this was one of the biggest attraction that last year when I said because of the, it was the timing when the spin off from Bosch Health. And this is a great opportunity. And obviously with Brent now and bringing a lot of the new team members, I think we're seeing a lot of uh, dynamics happening towards looking to more innovations, building the the future organization for a company that has that tremendous history of 170 years. It's really well said. Uh, Yes. And Andrew, you mentioned, you know, Mibo and some of these others uh, recent I mean, that was one, you know, key development that occurred in terms of an acquisition. Obviously, Novartis just recently in terms of that eye care uh, division that that you've now acquired that includes, obviously, Zydra. Uh, you mentioned Mibo itself specifically. How, how do you and the company see these kind of working together? And uh, and you mentioned we talked a little bit about Mibo. This might be a good time to kind of discuss where the company sees this being positioned. I mean, I spent a lot of time in Dry Eye, obviously, one of the largest, I think, clinics in the U.S. dedicated to that. But I'd love to get kind of the company's thinking when they acquire two assets. I believe it's a perfect synergy. I think this is how we have to treat these diseases. But I don't think most companies and even payers often think of it that way. They think of Dry Eye, there must be one silver bullet, which is not the case. What was the thinking process that allowed you to come into obtaining these two key assets in Dry Eye space? Yeah, Paul, look, you know, I'll spend more time talking about MIBO and, and more time really talking about the, the general way that we look at the, the dry eye market and the disease category, you know, as a whole. So right now, uh, while we signed our deal with Novartis and we're very excited about that, there's a process that needs to take place between signing that deal and, and ultimately closing it. So our focus from a commercial organization right now is 100% on making sure that we're ready to bring MIBO to the market. Um, and so you mentioned this, Paul, and this is obviously uh, spending time with yourself and, and with many of your colleagues in the field trying to understand the, the real complexity of this disease. And for many years, we've only had the opportunity to really impact the aqueous deficient component of dry eye with different immunomodulators or anti-inflammatories or, or other uh, treatments that exist today, but yet we've never had that evaporative dry eye opportunity, and that's what MIBO represents. And so it, it is a completely new uh, and differentiated uh, asset with a completely different mechanism, and one that we think really will help patients because of, as you taught me, Paul, that the number of, of patients who simply are just not satisfied with the current treatment, yet the vast number of patients that that have dry eye and that are dry eye sufferers. And that number is only increasing with the amount 
of uh, devices, of tablets, of Zoom calls, you know, that, that we're on, uh, you know, on a, on a day to day basis. Um, so, so we are certainly excited about this category as a whole, uh, and most importantly, with uh, the recent approval of MIBO and ultimately the commercial launch of the asset later this year. Great answer. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to comment too on your positioning, thinking of MIBO as as it, uh, you know, we're expecting that to be available here maybe in the fall or soon. That uh, gives us a chance to target that uh, that group of patients in the evaporative category, which, yeah, we all know the number. 86% of dry patients have some evaporative component, and nothing is yet targeted that group until this product now being approved. Yeah. So, so Paul, the way I look at it, one, I was very excited with MIBO because it's uh, number one, as you said, it target a category in dry eye that were overlooked or not overlooked, but usually were treated at the chronic stages when the patient's already is in the inflammatory stage and we didn't have much options to address the evaporative component of it. The second was also MIBO from a mechanism of action, as well as from a technology that the first dropless or waterless type of eye drops existing it's by itself is a great, we know with the water-based eye drops, majority of it goes outside the eye and the patient doesn't really benefit much from such eye drops, especially is if the concentration is low and, and patients are not used to put the eye drops correctly in their eye. Now with this technology, it's easier. 100% is the active. You can get all the active inside the eye and the mechanism of action is really have shown in the clinical trials, where the, the pivotal trials, great results. It's maybe the first two trials that are replicating exactly the same results without have to do like seven trials to get one sign and one symptom as they usually the FDA would request. So a lot of excitement really about a product that it is working very effectively. It's a very safe based on the profile that we demonstrated in the clinical studies. And at the same time, it addresses a big unmet medical need. Having said that, we need to look at well at the holistic view of the whole dry eye. And this is the second excitement that I have when we look to the whole portfolio, hopefully now once we close the deal on Zydra, that will be adding, because we look at it from a patient journey perspective. A dry eye is a chronic disease. Once they get in the chronicity phase, the patient will be there for some good time. And we need to look at it to address it from different sides, not only the evaporative, but also the inflammatory side, maybe at the milder cases from some of the artificial tears. So really looking at the patients from an unmet medical need and not specifically looking at a category or a part of the indication, what really excites me about this whole portfolio now. I like that thinking. It makes a lot of sense to think of the continuum of the disease because I, it does tend to be a progressive disease over time. There are different needs at different stages, different levels of, of evaporative, and then inflammation ensues very quickly, all of kind of that working together. And I like their understanding of that because I think that's really where we need to be positioned to make a difference for these 38 million or so patients that suffer from dry eye. I'm going to shift gears a little bit because um, just one of the assets I was fortunate to be involved with um, in, in kind of helping with the questionnaires and the whole area of chronic pain uh, that, that may come from, you know, no, with the Novartis deal if you, when you close, it was a drug in development for that. Uh, I think it was uh, SAF 312. Yes. This asset's currently being studied for, it's more of a proof of concept stage, but yeah. uh, the results were available at the end of 2023 and we're looking forward to that. But how important is moving in not just this asset, but just kind of moving in, in these indications for unmet needs. You mentioned it earlier, mm -hmm. as far as the future pipeline. Is this a focus for Bausch & Lohm or is it really to cover all areas? Because there's obviously very large patient categories like dry eye that you're in, uh, but this really kind of lends itself more to a very specific unmet need. Tell us a little bit about your strategy there. And I'm happy to start, and then obviously Andrew can comment after the rest, uh, from a mark from the market perspective as well. The way we look at it, obviously, we are still at the very early stages of this asset. It's still in the proof of concept, so I want to be very cautious also about the the promise that it can give. But 
definitely when we look at it from a disease biology perspective and the mechanism of action, we know that uh, TRPV1 receptors existing on the corneal nerve terminals, and they are really could be responsible for pain. So blocking or antagonistic effects on these receptors would definitely make sense from a mechanism of action to work in such pain indications. Having said that, we need to realize also that pain and the populations that suffer from chronic pain are very heterogeneous. In other words, there is a difference between a pain post PRK versus a pain with chronic dry eye versus a pain with a corneal ulcer. So we have to be cautious about the, the term chronic pain in general. And I think what how we look at this, we look at it at a very good opportunity for us in order to complement our ocular surface portfolio to get in certain areas uh, of the diseases, could be like dry eye or other areas, that addresses a specific pain population, not necessarily to be very heterogeneous. Having said that, we also need to demonstrate, and we are looking for the results from this study, not only to show us the proof of concept, but we need to look at the duration of effect, because if we're going to target chronic, we need to see also longer results from the clinical trial. And we want to make sure also that the studies are designed in not to have, uh, you, one of the biggest challenges with pain, Paul, as you probably know better than me, is the threshold for pain is different from one patient to the other. And the variability could be very high. So we want to make sure also from a study design and heterogeneity or homogeneity of the population that we are addressing the right endpoints, the duration and everything. So still long way to go, but I think it is a great opportunity. And this, this is how we think about it. It could be a great opportunity to complement our ocular surface portfolio. <laughs> That's well said, and I agree. And that you know, we've had had many terms: corneal neuralgia, neuropathic pain. You know, you know, neuropathic dry eye pain. It's a lot of different terminologies, but it really is a chronic pain. And and I think you summed it up perfectly in terms of the understanding of it. And and yes, different thresholds that play a role from patient to patient. But I, it's it's just good to see you know areas where we have some of our toughest patients and companies. You know, directing some of their uh, their focus and energy um, into that. Any added comments, Andrew? Yeah, no, Paul, just building on what both of you and you here said, what, what excites me about it is it's more representative of the future of our company, of, of looking at unmet needs that exist, of looking at diseases that you have patients coming into your office with uh, every day, Paul, and, and suffering from different uh, you know, uh, components, whether they're ocular surface diseases or, or other areas of our pipeline that we'll continue to think about and explore. It just represents the, the future of Bausch getting back to an innovative history and, and using that uh, as, as a platform for us to bring new products into the market. And so that's what I'm most excited about. And that's what the, the pipeline asset represents to me. That was excellent. Well, I'm going to make a couple of broad questions here as we get to the last portions of the podcast. But you know, I just in general, what, you know, excites you most about Bausch & Lomb as a company right now? I think you've touched on it a few times, uh, different areas of that, but is there any one particular thing that excites you the most about the company? Yeah, look, I, I mean, I'll, I'll start with just a couple of brief comments, right? So I think when you look broadly at eye care, if if you love being in this space, then then you have an opportunity to work at a company that's completely dedicated to that mission. And wherever you want to take your career, whether that's in the pharma space, the consumer space, surgical vision care, we have such a broad-based offering as to what the, the company has been and what the future of the company will be as it relates to, to working within this space. Um, I think with the leadership that we have, we're definitely going to be bold and, and be aggressive in terms of uh, looking at opportunities to not only grow shareholder value and, and do things for the company that separates us from, from the rest of the competition, but, but also uh, really have, uh, most importantly, meaningful products that, uh, that are helpful, Paul, to, to folks like yourself and, and to your colleagues in, uh, in building practices and, and working with, with you directly and working with, with um, all of the different uh, parts of the ecosystem with an eye care. So there's just a lot of exciting things happening at the company and, and a lot that we'll, uh, we'll continue to do over the, over the coming years together. Great. Yeah, yeah, what excites you most about the company, looking at it from 
your positioning in, in R and D and and kind of leading that direction um, as you know having joined now since 2021 and being part of this, especially thinking of your background and what you've been involved in over 13 years even prior. What uh, what's different? What excites you about Bauschmal? So so I think and I know Andrew addressed some of it, but the exciting part uh, for me is one that we become very dedicated for the eye care area. I mean. As I mentioned, once you are part of a bigger organization, like what happens with acquisitions, you really don't have the focus and the investments to put a lot in the eye care because your pool of investment becomes very diversified in a lot of portfolio. So just the idea that I spend all my budget in an areas of unmet medical eye care, this excites me a lot. Second, I would like really to compliment a lot the people in, in Boshanlam. There are great people. There are great talents. And having worked in the industry for a very long period of time and joined a lot of companies, I tell that every day here I learn new things. And people here still keep telling me about things that we probably didn't invest. And there's great opportunities that excites me that are coming from the people within this great company that has 170 years uh, inheritance in, in, in eye care. And then obviously the third is I think we we are investing quite good amount of money in the R and D currently. I think it's all about how we direct this money towards the innovations and ultimate medical needs. Uh, we have a huge portfolio of products between surgical, medical, consumer, and vision care, and the idea really is to try to put the best of our bets in the right place for innovations. And this excites me a lot that we are able now with the new management, with the new company, that we are able also to focus in these new areas. That's great. Yeah, yeah. you also mentioned earlier, uh, you know, something that also intrigued me as far as clinical results. And that is when, you know, Mybo achieved, you know, primary endpoints and secondary, of course, but both signs and symptoms, and then repeated it in just very second study. Most Try eye drugs in particular do signs and then repeat it and do symptoms and then repeat it. And you're looking at four plus studies uh, to yeah. be able to do it in two is quite uh, unique. And that's for me, certainly a very significant clinical result. But looking at the vast portfolio you have, I, be, I don't I think doctors know the extent or even investors who listen to these podcasts know the extent of therapeutics that you have. It's, it's really a very vast area. You also mentioned surgical vision care. Uh, is quite intriguing, but I think that the pharmaceutical side, just sheer number of products. Are there any, you know, in particular of these medications that stand out to you in terms of their mechanism of action or that intrigue you a little more than others? Well, I, I, as I mentioned, I think that there are a lot of products that we have, especially on the therapeutic side, we are trying to cover a lot of uh, disease areas and geographic areas. So you can imagine also that we have some products that are dedicated to certain geographies, like could be Europe, could be Asia, and really the portfolio is huge. Having said that, the majority of them are really trying to address a lot of existing art medical need. You know, last year or two years, when probably when I joined, around the time when I joined, there was the launch of Zypair as well. This is for the uveitis indication. Again, it is the first suprachoroidal delivery system that we have delivered to the market. Uh, not necessarily, and this is, by the way, was also in allergen, not necessarily the innovation has to be a new molecule. It could be a delivery system. It could be something related to the patient, how we are addressing the patient's uh, uh, device drug combinations. So what excites me in some of these assets is, is really that we are trying always to look to either an innovation in the delivery or innovation in the mechanism of action or a completely new molecular entity. We're having one in the pipeline. It's a very old molecule, but still we're looking for a new delivery system to treat myopia. Uh, we hope that through this also we can achieve some good results. It's still at the clinical stage, so we still have to be cautious about the results of that. Very exciting. Andrew, let me leave you with this question here too. Uh, I know the future is impossible to predict, um, but I'll have both answer it. I'll start with Andrew. Where would you like to see Bausch Shalom in the next three to five years? Yeah, look, so so Paul, if we have a crystal ball, I would, uh, I'd like to predict that the future of MIBO is um, really helping patients, uh, you know, as we've talked about on, on a few different occasions throughout the course of this call, being a, a very different uh, therapeutic 
for, for the treatment of dry eye. Uh, I'd like to see us continue expanding our pipeline and our ways of bringing new innovations in the ocular surface disease, but then um, thinking about the uh, pharmaceutical market more broadly, how can we continue to look at other areas in glaucoma, in retina, in um, neuroprotection, and, and so many others where there are instances where there's good products, but there's still certainly opportunities for us to bring differentiated products that, that will, will help patients and provide value uh, to the overall system. So um, in the next three to five years, I would definitely uh, expect us to have uh, you know, a, a much deeper pipeline where we are bringing new medicines to, uh, to the marketplace uh, on an annualized basis, right? And, and that's not always uh, an easy um, you know, uh, delivery in, in terms of, of having success. There's, there's plenty of challenges that exist in, in R&D and, and working not only uh, in R&D, but collaborating with commercial on, on how we bring products to market. Uh, and there's there's tons of challenges there, but yet I think the team that we put in place here uh, really will stand out in, in how we can meet that challenge and bring those products uh, in the future. So that's what I'm most excited about, Paul. Great. Yeah, yeah. Final comments? No, I think, I think uh, as, uh, again, I don't want to repeat what Andrew said, but definitely it's the future is looking great for Bosch and Lam. We... We're starting with the organization, building the right teams, bringing the new areas of uh, talents also that they were not existing before and start after this to deliver on the pipeline, but look to the innovations that will come in the future. I think uh, we want really to start to look for areas that either have the highest unmet medical need in areas where there is no treatment available. That's, that's the highest unmet medical need. Obviously, we can also look to areas where there are available treatment, but to come maybe with the best in class, better profile, better safety, better efficacy. So we're looking now into these areas. I think we know exactly where majority of the innovations are going. And this is where we will just have to look carefully about what is the most suitable for us also considering our capabilities because each company has its own DNA and each company has its own strengths of capabilities. So we'll be looking how to match and marry these two together in order to come hopefully with the best innovations. Awesome. Well done. Well, thank you both. You guys just did a terrific job uh, in your interview as always, but thanks for all the insights. Uh, you know, obviously some very well-deserved positive momentum and excitement at Bausch & Lohm. It's great to get to delve into why that's occurring, uh, both from a product perspective and from a leadership perspective. So thank you for being so uh, forefront and sharing these insights and congratulations, continue the great work. It's gonna help millions of patients. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Paul.